Good morning. Good evening. Oh, that's right. It's <laughs> evening in Belgium. Good morning in California. Good evening in Belgium. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. It's Have been you... a while. I feel like I've, I, it's like I've missed you. <laughs> I know. I miss you, too. We just need to do this every week. I know. I know. I think it's I'm getting frozen. There. Getting there. I, do you see that? My mug is frozen already. I know. <laughs> That's it's, hilarious. It's, Adam is the one who keeps doing it because he just gets a riot out of it. He thinks it's hilarious. Adam does? Well, that's okay. No worries. That's you say, Mom, it's a great shot. Look at you. Aw, thanks, Adam. I sure miss you. He's saying I miss you too, Mama. I love you. I love you too. So you brought some really cool friends with you today. Please introduce them. He says I did, and they are not only portrayed as being super cool, but they actually have a very interesting life story. And um, he's saying the reason I invited them over is because I want to make it clear to everyone that you can't always trust on what um, the media expresses or what they show you. Um, and so therefore I, I, um, brought forth very in two very interesting men, he says, who, uh, did not have an easy life, um, but still made it to, to become <laughs> famous, <laughs> um, wow. something they never foresaw. So, um, with me today, he says, is Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. And, good morning, uh, gentlemen. They're saying, good morning, ma'am. <laughs> I love the way people always say, ma'am. Me too. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it just sounds so polite. There's something about um, a ma'am, especially if it has two syllables, like it comes with a southern accent, ma'am. <laughs> good morning, ma'am. Um, they're just, uh, they're a little nervous is what I'm feeling. So I'm not really sure. I'm telling them it's, it's not necessary to be nervous. Um, but they're making me feel like, um, although people think that they've had this great heroic life and, you know, this really cool um, identity, um, they're saying that, you know, for us, this is an extremely hard life, a very confusing life, and um, far from glorious as what they portray it in the, in the movies, she says. I can so. imagine. It sounds like high anxiety to me. Yeah. <laughs> they just seem nervous. <laughs> it's like, we, it's almost like Adam's, Adam's saying, you know, they just don't want to disappoint people. They don't want to take away, you know, the glory that's been surrounding them. Um, but they do want to be honest about this and they want to uh, just make it clear that, you know, whatever you see on TV and whatever you see in, um, in even um, documentaries, you know, mm -hmm. um, listen to your heart and, and, and see, okay, what sounds like, uh, you know, I can, I can relate to this or, or this kind of seems iffy or that is kind of really weird. You know, it's about trusting your feelings when it comes to media, when it comes to the news, when it comes to what, um, you know, what people bring forth, uh -huh. um, trusting your own gut into understanding and, and getting a feel of what is truth. Um, and what is sensation? <laughs> um, yeah, especially now. It is. And saying that's why we thought it was so important to kind of show you who we really were. We want to take away the illusion that people have created around us. And we want to show you that um, we're not what people portray us to be we are not these heroes we are not these um, very brave people that that people portrayed us as but we were really very much afraid of life we were terrified of what is going on um, in our lives and that's why um, although a lot of people were against my friendship with Doc that's why we got along so well because we were both terrified uh, trying to survive a world that didn't seem very logic to us so um, Wyatt says 
He says, with your permission, I would like to tell my life story. Um, I'm not going to take a whole life to say it, he says, but I would like to um, kind of give you a glimpse of how it was to be Wyatt. I would be honored, Mr. Earp, if you would share that with us. He's saying, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me a voice. Um, he says, what you need to understand is, as Wyatt, um, it was one of the hardest lives that I've had, if you look at all my lives. Um, I was a very distraught, very lonely, um, very lost person. And he says, it all started with um, the family that I was born into. He says, um, I was born into a rather large family. Um, I had seven siblings. Um, he's kind of giving me the feeling that his father was kind of a, a deadbeat. Oh, wow. <laughs> so call it. Um, he's making me feel like his father was always trying to make money some way, in some way or form. But he would get in trouble. He would get in debt. Everything he would try um, was either illegal or, um, you know, he he would betray others to make a buck. And it would always backflash on us. It was always backfire. Okay. And so he's saying my whole childhood we were moving around, constantly fleeing from people that he was indebted to, uh, fleeing from, uh, you know, not going to prison. Um, so I never really had a home. I never had a stable environment where I could make friends, um, you know, where I could get educated. And so we were constantly on the move. We were constantly running from my dad's mischief. Um, and he says, you know, my mom and dad, they were not um, the most loving People, they, I didn't feel that motherly love that I should have felt. Um, I just felt like I was a number and I was there to help them um, raise money. I was there to help them with the work. I was there to help with watching over uh, other siblings. Um, so I felt more like I was, uh, I came into this world with a job. <laughs> I didn't come into this world with love. Um, and so my whole um, childhood, as we are moving along, never allowed to make any friends, never allowed to um, to feel attachment to people because I didn't, you know, I didn't make any friends eventually because I knew we weren't going to be there very long. So I was very much to myself. And although I had a lot of siblings, um, we were kind of relied on one another to um, to get through life. Mm -hmm. uh, he's saying, you know, eventually um, my father had heard about this um, land opportunity mm -hmm. that you could uh, buy like land and you could, you know, put a farm on it. And he was really excited about that. So, yeah. again, we're on our way to California, he says. And along the way, my sister got ill. And so we had to stop. And um, she, um, my father bought a piece of land where we had stopped. Um, and we decided to stay there. She died eventually um, on that new uh, plot of land, on that new farm, he says. And so um, after a few months, he decided to go into, uh, it's almost like he's going into like a bigger town or a bigger city where he's trying to make money again. Mm -hmm. And basically he says, I was left at, at 13 years old with uh, my two younger brothers to take care of an 80-acre uh, farm. That was my job, 13 years old, and I had to do all the work um, together with my brothers. She said I had to watch over them because they were younger than me, um, and that was my life. And so my whole life, my whole childhood, I felt like I didn't matter. I felt like um, I wasn't loved, um, and I didn't feel even my family. I didn't feel like I had a family. They were just people that just my life. 
Um, he says, when I was 17, I had had enough. My father had gotten an injury and he had come home to the farm and I decided to leave. So um, at 17 years old, I had no plan. I did not know what I wanted to do. I had no skills. I never went to school. I didn't know, um, you know, I didn't know any trade. So I couldn't say I'm this or I'm that. I was just on my own, but I needed to get out of there. I ran. I fled the scene. <laughs> um, and he's saying, you know, um, I didn't do so well. <laughs> I got into trouble. Um, I did all kinds of jobs. Um, I went from one job to the next job to the next job and so on. Um, and he's saying, um, eventually I heard of, he heard of um, <clears throat> kind of like uh, little towns that would pop up. He's kind of showing me how they were building the railroad, mm -hmm. right, for the trains, sure, and yeah. you see how ev everywhere where they had to build, these little towns would pop up, mm -hmm. you know, workers and fur and so on, um, and he, he's, he's, he's making me feel like that kind of seemed, or that he, he got attracted to that, because he felt like, oh, there's going to be a lot of work there, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people, new people I get to meet, and so he was really drawn to that, and um so he started going from town to town to town. <laughs> Again, you know, never settling down, never having that those roots, you know. Um, and he's saying after wandering around from town to town, doing all these different things, um, he's saying, I went back home after a while because nowhere, anywhere that I went to, he said, I, I never had the steady income. I never had um, enough money to make it. I was always on the on the edge of falling off. And so um, I went home to Virgil. Virgil had started something on his own. Um, not really sure what it is, but it, it just makes me feel like Virgil kind of had settled. No, Virgil you know? is his brother, correct? Yes, Virgil okay. is his brother. Um, and he's making me feel like Virgil settled something that he always wanted yeah he, he had his own family um he started his own business and so he went home he went back to virgil he didn't go back to his parents he went home to virgil and um he's saying it was actually a good time for me because oh. i finally felt like i belonged somewhere oh that's wonderful and he says i was really hopeful and um it gave me Seeing him and his wife, it gave me a feeling that there's hope. Mm. There's hope. If he can do it, so can I. And so I, I was filled with a, a very positive energy when I was there. I was filled with this. Um, all of a sudden, I had faith that everything was going to work out for me. I had a really deep feeling inside. Um, and as I was in that happy state, I met a girl. Oh. And I fell in love, he says. Aww. And things seemed to work out fine. We got married. She got pregnant. And I was ecstatic. I wanted to be the best father that I could have ever been. Um, knowing that how my father treated me, I wanted to show him how it should have been done, how you need to treat your wife and how you need to treat your children. Right. Um, so I was extremely happy about that. And he's saying, you know, Unfortunately, my wife got ill, and she died right before the baby was supposed to be born. And so my baby died with her. And when that happened, he says, my world collapsed. Everything that I had believed in, my hope was taken away from me, and my whole world shattered. And I went into what people would call a self-destruction mode. I left, I took off, um, and I really tried to stay alive, he says. That was pretty much my only idea, was to stay alive. So uh, I went back to certain towns, you know, I, <laughs> I did some jobs. Um, he's making me feel like he, 
He hanged out with a lot of prostitutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he says, you know, I needed to find some kind of comfort sure. somewhere. Sure. It, you know, so looking for that kind of motherly feel, you know, something that I always missed. And mm -hmm. he says, you know, eventually I ended up with one of the prostitutes. We got married. Um, and he's saying, you know, it wasn't really out of love. Um, it was more of um, trying to look for something to hold on to. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. It was more of a healing process than anything else. Um, but eventually, you know, I did things. I uh, <laughs> I had a brothel. <laughs> so I heard. So I was what people would call a pimp. <laughs> Kevin. Um, but he said, you know what? But he, Nowadays, he's saying there is so much, you know, controversy about that, you know? Mm -hmm. It's still seen as, hmm, you don't do that, and that's not. But in those days, that was perfectly normal. It was a normal business. I was a businessman at that time. Well, in um, some parts of the world, it still is. Yeah, so, you know, it's all in how you see it. But he mm -hmm. says, in my time, it was a business, and it was, you know, it was pretty lucrative at certain times. I can imagine. Uh, but he's saying, you know... Uh, when winter came and fall, you know, business would slow down because there would be less workers there mm -hmm. uh, in those towns. There would be less people working on um, on the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, and so business would slow down. So um, eventually I, um, I kind of volunteered, he says, to help, like, um, like help the sheriff mm -hmm. um, to – catch bad guys or, you know, catch criminals to bring people to court, etc. And so uh, I just volunteered. I did not get paid for it, but I needed to do something um, that made me feel like I made a difference. Sure. And you say, you know, I, in that, I kind of felt my calling. I found that I found comfortable in that role, mm -hmm. um, and I became respected. And um, that feeling of being seen, mm. that feeling of, hey, you know, you're doing a good job, getting respect, that feeling of I'm doing something to help. I'm, um, in a way, he says, it helped me with my, my own insecurities. It made me feel more confident about myself. Mm -hmm. it, it made me overcome um, the fears that I had and the anxieties about um, how life was. And I really started feeling comfortable in the role. And you say, I really grew into that deputy role um, and uh, eventually, um, you know, grew further um, up the ladder. And he's saying, you know, in those days, you had... You had the rich, <laughs> he's saying, so that you had kind of like uh, the farmers and the cowboys, and then you had kind of like the, um, he's showing me like the business owners and, um, you yeah, know, the more elite uh -huh. group, as I would call it. And he's showing me how they're nicely dressed with the big hats mm -hmm. and, you know, very, um, very nicely um, portrayed with the women with the little, with the real umbrellas, and oh you know, I just like that time because I think it's so romantic. But I'm probably romanticizing the time in my head. But um, it's probably, it probably wasn't as glamorous as we think it was. Um, so I, no, <laughs> not glamorous no. at all. No hair, yeah. no blow dryers. No, 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 no. And uh, you know, once a week a bath in yeah. those kind of heats and things like that. And he's saying, sure. you know. The smell was something you just got used to. <laughs> you didn't smell it eventually yeah. anymore. Um, so, you know, he's saying it was not romantic, not at all. But um, eventually I started looking up to those people. I started to want to become part of the elite. And um, I really started feeling it, how would he's saying, okay, so I, I kind of let my ego take over. Uh oh, <laughs> and I started to become very ego based. He says I became extremely um, engaged in the more wealthier society. 
Uh, I wanted to be like them. They had respect. They had power. You know, they had knowledge. Um, they were smart. They were educated. I wanted to be that way, he says. Um, and so after hearing um, my brothers again who had heard that um, – there was a big, it's, it's almost like a, um, an explosion of mines where they would look for gold and silver. Oh, the gold and all rush. That. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's showing me how there was this huge explosion of, mm -hmm. of all these uh, cities that were starting where they would gain all these resources out of the right. ground. Mm hmm um, and so um, Virgil had also heard of something like that, and he they kind of went and looked for fortune. <laughs> well, yeah. We were, we were like, okay, uh, I, I, you know, he felt like he had reached the top when it came to the whole um, sheriff thing, and uh, you know, he wanted more. He wanted to be more financially stable. He wanted to live a life of luxury. And that's what he wanted together with his brothers. They wanted the same thing. They Don't forget, he says, we grew up in poverty. We sure. grew up in debt. We were always struggling. And so um, seeing that and seeing those people enjoy life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and eating ice cream every day. And that's something that I really love, he says. Um, but um, the luxuries that they had was something that we we always wanted to experience we always longed for and so we were we went um we were on our way um and he says you know when we first he's making me feel like this was um i've seen that movie i think with, with the tombstone thing yes yes my husband loves that movie uh, i'm not too fond of western movies sorry but um i just I know my, my husband loves that movie. Mm -hmm. um, but so I guess they went to Tombstone. Tombstone, um, Tombstone Arizona was actually a town. Uh huh. And he said, you know what? We got there. There was actually not a lot of people there. There was actually not a lot of people there. Um, it was uh, a very new town. Mm -hmm. It just got started. And he's saying, but the soil there was very rich. Oh, that's great. And he's saying, you know, but uh, with time, very fast, more and more investors would come mm -hmm. with big machines to really dig up all this uh, glorious uh, money, he says. Um, and so we were kind of pushed aside with our little <laughs> enterprise. We were run over by the big, the big dogs. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, you know, he's saying... When that happened, um, he's kind of making me feel like they kind of went back into, or his, his brother went back into uh, like being a marshal or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, he didn't, he says. At first I was doing like, um, he's um, showing me like these, um, how do you call that in English? <laughs> coaches, coaches, is that, a, is that like the right the word? Like stage coach? Are you talking about yeah. a carriage that is drawn by horses? By horses. Yes. It's a coach. It's a, coach, a stage coach. Oh. Okay. And so he's making me feel like he would do, um, he would do like drive around and pickups and dropping off mm -hmm. uh, and making sure everything was safe. It's kind of what he's making me feel like he was doing. Um, now he's saying the thing that people forget and that they never show in the movies. <laughs> Because he says, I know about my movie. Um, <laughs> he's saying what they never show in those days is that we also had a lot of politics. Oh, yeah. Just like we have now. And they were sure. just as corrupt then as they are now. <laughs> yeah. Some things never change. It never changes. So, you know, you can always kind of feel this tension, he says, be mm -hmm. between wealthier people mm -hmm. and you know the the more farmers uh, you know poor people and so there was always a tension there and so he says um, we had people who would take who would kind of um, discard any rules or regulations and we would call, you know we would call them cowboys now cowboys have seen completely different but in those days they were considered like criminals so a cowboy was somebody who didn't follow the yeah. law. 
Okay. Yeah. They would just not follow the law and they would just do whatever they felt like. And, you know, some of them were thieves, some of them were not. You know, they were not always bad people. Right. Uh, some just wanted to be free. You know, some some just wanted to do what they felt like and, and just be like that. Um, not hurt anybody, but some of them could be pretty intense. Um, and so he's making me feel like from, from like, um, how, how do you say it? From, it's almost like government. Was there a government back then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I know nothing about American history. I do apologize, people. I don't know anything about American history. We never, they never, they don't teach much here in Europe when it right. comes to American yes, history. Yes, there was a government in, in place, sure. Yeah, and they're making me, he's making me feel like from government there was kind of a push to, to, to stop this law, you know, law. The law, lawlessness, yes. Uh -huh. Lawless. Oh my God! What is up with these words? Um, yeah, and they kind of became a pressure on there. Now he's saying um, so they were starting to become, you know, kind of strict on on what these people were doing, mm -hmm. um, and he's saying there was an argument about some. Uh, in, it, it kind of feels like stolen horses. There was an argument of something with a farmer mm -hmm. um, about some stolen horses and um, Virgil believed that he had taken them, that he had bought them or he had um, stolen them. And he's saying, you know, we never really, they never really had the proof, but he still said you did it and, uh, you know, all the leads lead to you and blah, blah, blah. So it kind of started this, this feud. So Virgil, Virgil accused somebody of having stolen some horses. Yeah, he accused a farmer, he okay. says, that he had stolen, like, uh, horses that were from the U.S. Army. Okay. Right? Uh -huh. But they, the farmer never allowed them into his property, and so he never really got to look for it. He never found the horses either, but he still said, you did it. And because he kind of put the blame on him, that farmer got really annoyed with my family, he says, with my brothers and with me. Um, and so kind of that's how it all started. And, and a lot of people don't know that, but it was really a stupid kind of uh, incident um, that led to so much bloodshed. But he's saying that's what really what started it. It was uh, my you? brother putting the blame on somebody for stealing horses, which they had no proof for. And that person, we knew, he says, Virgil knew that that person would make deals with the cowboys. He would buy stolen horses from them. Okay. So he, they knew that. Um, but in that time, there was nothing they could do about it. Okay. So, so they assumed that he bought these horses that were stolen. That's probably what they assumed. So is this the McLowry's? Is that the person you're, because there was like a famous feud between your, you and your brothers and the McLowrys. Um, he gives me a sense of yes. Yeah. Um, he's talking about, um, there were several brothers on that ranch. Or yes. Something. Yes. So that was, people. it was Wyatt and Virgil. And I think one of their brothers, and there were several brothers um, in the family that were accused by Virgil of having stolen the horses. So, yeah, there was a feud between the McLowrys and the Earps. Yeah. So he's, he's making me feel like this accusation started everything. This right. is what made okay. uh, everything explode. And so, um, you know, I mean... He said, you know, a lot of people know what happens next, you know. <laughs> um, um, he's, he's making me feel like that farmer um, got into some kind of fight with his friend who was Doc Holiday. <laughs> he's going, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we'll wait till he gets his story done. <laughs> he's saying he always got all the charm and the light. <laughs> Wyatt. <laughs> But he's saying, so, um, you know, 
Doc had already had, had come to that town as well, and, and I guess they something about uh, you know cheating, and, and it was kind of like there was a gambling thing going on, and they were playing cards of some sort, and and it just you know one got drunk, the other one got drunk, they just kind of had a you know a, an argument, and so um, Wyatt pulled them apart. He pulled them apart or something, and it, it makes me feel like. Um, that farmer got really upset, and so he started drinking and drinking and drinking some more, <laughs> drinking his misery away. Um, and I guess he 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 threatened them. He threatened them in some way or form. Um, and so that's how everything started when it comes to that shooting thing that they show in the movie. Oh, um, you're talking about the gunfight at the OK Corral. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, so that's a pretty famous incident. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're talking about. The gunfight at the OK Corral between the Earps and the McLowrys. Okay. Yeah, he said, you know, again, there was my ego. Well, sure. My, I should have, he's saying, you know, looking back at it now, um, I should have just uh, blown it off. He was drunk, he was upset, and he was, you know, we threatened him. You know, we threatened him first. We said, you did it. You know, we accused him without any evidence so in a way, we started this. Um, and what he said, he did, and he said while he was completely wasted. So, uh, you know, a lot of people will make threats and a lot of people will do things like that. So um, looking back at it now, I should have just walked away. But my ego got in the way. Um, the lust for feeling like I'm in charge the lust for power, the lust of uh, showing others that I am better than they are, mm. took me over. And, 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 and for that, I feel extremely ashamed, he says. I don't feel like a hero. For me, that's a very shameful part of my life, that I um, got overtaken by such greed, by such ego you know, ego, this big ego trip of I'm going to show you and, you know, I can crush you whenever I feel like it. That's really what I felt inside because he's saying, you know, they did try to stop us. They did try to talk us out of it, but oh. I would not listen. We would not listen. And uh, my brothers followed me because they wanted me to be okay, not because they believed in this fight. They actually didn't want to do this. This was me, he says, and I would not let anyone talk me out of it. Um, and so they went with me to protect me. They went with me. Um, and for that, I still feel guilty because it led to my brother's death. Um, and so in that, I, I, I take complete blame on myself that this happened. Um, he says, in that moment, when we confronted them, um, we were in a little area, he says, a little area behind the building. Um, and he says, it went so fast mm -hmm. that in less than 30 seconds, these people had been killed. It only took us a few bullets. Uh, not like they show in the movies. It was an enormous fight. It was 30 seconds and it was over. Um, and he says certain people died. I felt really bad about because um, he's making me feel like there were two people there that were just weren't supposed to be there is what he's making me feel. Okay. Uh, and they were just kind of, yeah, in the wrong place at the wrong time. So collateral uh, damage? Just yeah. Oh. Um, and he's saying that really um, broke me inside. I didn't show that to anybody. I had too much pride, and I didn't want people to think that I was weak. So um, I struggled with that for a very long time. But I tried to tell myself, I tried to convince myself that what I had done was 
was the right thing to do. He threatened us, so he had to go. Um, but in my heart, it didn't feel like it was the right thing. I felt really bad. He said, you know, you have to keep in mind that until that point, I had never killed a man. Right. He says, I had, uh, as, my, as my previous job as a sheriff, you know, I would... Um, I did shoot once at a person, um, but that was only like once. <laughs> I usually just hit him in the head and I would drag him along. Oh, <laughs> hit him. Okay. You know, I would use my gun. He says, I would just hit him on oh, the head. Oh, I see. You knocked him out. You didn't shoot them. I knocked okay. him out. I would hit him uh, uh, on their temple and they would just be passed out. And then I would just cuff him and take him away. Uh, that's what I usually did. You know, this yeah. was face to face, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's you or it's me. Um, and that, it scared me very much. Oh yeah. But, um, he says, I, uh, I just couldn't let it go. I couldn't let go uh, of the threats that he had made. And, um, he says to this day, I still regret that. But he's saying, you know, it happened. Um, it happened for a reason. Um, he's saying it taught me to. It taught me to see that ego only leads to negative things. Now he's saying, unfortunately, one thing started leading to another. We started getting attacked back, mm -hmm. uh, and eventually we kind of felt like. Um, there's no solution to this. The only way we can get rid of what is going on is to really eliminate them. It's to really, in order to protect ourselves, we thought that we had to eliminate the ones who were trying to hurt us. Who were trying to the enemy, us. right. Yeah, so, um, so we really started to getting tough on these guys and we really started to, um, you know, and go after him in some way or form. Um, and he says, you know, when they killed my brother, I totally lost it. Now, are you, re are you referring to a younger brother, not Virgil, correct? Yes. Um, he's he's um, showing me a different one who, um, it just looks like he was shot in the back is what it looks like. Right. And Virgil died well, later, I think. Yeah. Morgan, I think. Say what? what? Morgan? Is that right? That sounds right. More, that sounds right. Uh, you know, honestly, I am not really familiar with this story. I might know a little bit more than you. I saw the movie. I'm going to have to ask you, does Doc Holliday look at all like Val Kilmer? <laughs> I have to say, I think they're both very good looking, actually. You know, they're yeah, isn't Doc kind of long and lean and blonde? He's not blonde. Okay. It looks more like a lightish brown to me. Um, he looks pretty tall in my book. He looks yeah. pretty tall. Um, I have to say, they do kind of look like the actors. They do have something similar to him. But I think, sorry for the actors, but I actually think like the real people looked prettier, looked nicer. <laughs> Wow. Hey, look, he's handsome. Uh, sorry. Well, I'm going to have to, I mean, I'm sure that's quite all right with Wyatt and Doc. <laughs> um, no, I, yeah, I think you're very handsome, man. They look Aww. very handsome to me. Um, uh, a little frail, I would say. I mean, they, they look to me long and thin. <laughs> But they really have a gorgeous um, face, I think. They look very handsome. So um, they're saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, you know, I think Wyatt is just, you know, he's saying, you know, and I just went crazy. He said, I just went crazy. And um, I'm not proud of myself. No, it would uh, be a terrible grief. 
Yeah, he says, I, I killed people that were begging for their life. I killed uh, people with so much anger um, and so much hate that um, I lost me. I lost myself. I lost everything, he says. Um, he says, you know, after, the years after that, you know, I was um, accused of murder and I had to run. And I was really hoping to get a pardon for a long time, but that never happened. Um, but he says, my whole life, all the way up to my death, I dealt with the struggles of what I had done. I dealt with the fact that I had caused my brother's death. Um, and so I lived... If you look at my life, I mean, I had a few happy moments, very shortly, very briefly, but my whole life was pain. My whole life was fear and um, self-hate and anger and ego. And um, I did find a woman that I loved, that I stayed with till the day I died, mm -hmm. but it didn't take away the pain that I felt inside. It didn't take away um, the fact that um, I played God for a little bit. You never I, did have a child, did you? I didn't. I never did. I never became a parent. Um, I did have, or I tried to make the best of the rest of my life, um, but I lost Doc, and I lost my family after that. Um, we didn't have much contact anymore, me and Virgil. Um, we separated ways, and um, I pretty much, again, was on my own. Um, traveled around a lot, and I actually ended up to be the person that I never wanted to be, which was my father. I ended up like him, who was the person that I disliked the most. Um, so hmm. at the end of my life, I have to say I was extremely disappointed in me and I was extremely disappointed in my life. Um, and so when I crossed over, I went to a place, he says, that, um, was very dark because I didn't believe that I deserved to go to heaven. I believe that I deserve to go to hell uh, for what I had done. So, so let's be clear about what happened there. That that um, it wasn't that you crossed over and some judgmental entity or energy said because you did this, this is what's going to happen. This was your own doing, right? Was yes. your choice. This was my my belief. He says. His right. energy feels really heavy when he talks about this. But he's sure. saying, That's um, how he felt at the time. This was my belief. I believed in my heart that I was going to hell. Okay. I believed that I deserved this. Um, I see things differently now. Well, please <laughs> share that experience, though. Had, yeah, it was all a lesson. And it was not just a lesson for me. It was a lesson for everyone. Um, and I did not stay long in my darkness. What was it like, though, when you were in the darkness? Can you explain what it was like a little bit? He says, I, he's saying the feeling of emptiness and loneliness that I've always dealt with my whole life right. was just continued in this space. Um, I felt really abandoned. I felt alone. Um, and I felt, I felt like I didn't know who I was anymore. Um, it's almost like your identity kind of disappears. You're still there. Mm -hmm. You're still thinking, but it's like the identity that you were, the wider that I was, mm -hmm. at that time disappeared, and I became nothingness. Mm -hmm. it's, because, it's, it's a feeling of becoming completely whole inside, empty. And um, he's saying... I eventually started thinking, um, it's like I was desperately trying to hold on to some memories because everything was fading away. I was sure. forgetting everything. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, when I thought of my first wife, 
um, I remembered her face and I remembered how much I loved her. And right at that moment, a big bright light appears in front of me and says, are you ready to come home now? And so she took me and she took me out of darkness. And, um, and that's when the healing needed to begin. That's when the healing started. It was a process for me. Um, I had to make peace with the people who had taken their lives. And, you know, we, we are all okay now. <laughs> we are all okay. And we all understand it was a part of the lesson, a part of an experience. Um, but I have to say, you know, I don't wish my life upon anybody. Wow. And um, for a long time, he says, I... I uh, wanted to show the public when I was still alive. Uh, yeah. For a long time, I wanted to explain myself to people. I wanted to show people, sure. you know, the church and everything that went with it. And, you know, that what I did at that time I felt was right and so on and so forth. Um, I really wanted to explain myself to people. It's almost like I, I was in some way or form asking for forgiveness. Sure. In some way I was asking to be seen as a human and not as this negative entity. Um, and so I did try to sell my story and I did try to kind of, you know, get people interested in express, but it never happened. So you're you know? talking about in Hollywood, California, back in the day. Yes. So I actually went over there to try and sell my story, to try and say somebody needs to, you know, show people what really happened. Well, you're, the real uh, truth, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, and, and he says, you know, they never, they turned me down over and over and over again. And it never them. happened. <laughs> yeah, it never happened. And so he says, when I saw that there was all of a sudden movies popping up, I was like, it happened anyway. <laughs> Isn't that amazing <laughs> that it did? It happened posthumously. Yeah, and he's saying, you know. But it wasn't the real story. It wasn't the, your truth. Yeah, I'm saying it was more romanticized than sure, it was, you know, sure. they make it more uh, exciting than what it really was. Uh -huh. uh, you know, they make me look like this hero, which I don't think I am. No. Um, it, it was just, you know, one of those things that happened, and they like to, you know, make it more pleasant than it really was. Um, but he's saying, you know, when I was... Um, a few years before my death, he said, I met a little boy. He came knocking on my door. Oh. And he said, and he came in and he was so interested in my story and he just wanted to hang out and talk to me. And so I told him all the stories that I had. Um, and it felt like somebody saw me, somebody um, with an inch had an interest in the truth mm -hmm. and you know how it happened and how everything you know kind of um, started yeah. and I was really impressed with that person he said that he had the courage to come and knock on my door at that young age and he's saying you know this he's saying Adam told me that he allows people that come through to choose who comes next and so he has given me permission to ask this person to come in next week. Now, this little boy who came and talked to me turned out to be, when he grew up, John Wayne. And he used my stories as the basis for his characters. That's how it all what? happened. So you're telling me that little boy who knocked on your door, his name was Marion Michael Morrison. And he grew up to be John Wayne. God, mm -hmm. Adam, you are so awesome the way you pull off these surprises on your poor mama. <laughs> I allow them to pick somebody who oh. inspired them. That's what I do. I don't want to be the one choosing uh -huh. because they're, the world and the afterlife is filled with incredible stories everybody has a unique story so who am i to say you can do it and you can't so i allow my guests to pick one person who inspired them yeah. one person who made them feel incredible or who made them feel special and so wyatt chose um john wayne oh my gosh how exciting so we're gonna have the duke on july 12th 
That is amazing. Oh, that's so cool. I'm sorry. I am still getting teary about his wife crossing him over. Yes. Just got me. Whew. Okay. So, would and Doc so like Doc to is going, So, what about me? <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying about Doc. I want to hear about Doc, too. He's saying, you know, I just came as more as a supportive role for him mm -hmm. because I know that this really um, touched him on a deeper level than um, when it comes to me about my life. He's saying, when it comes to me, you know, I did come from a family who was supportive and I did mm -hmm. come from a family of wealth and stability. Right. Uh, and... Um, I grew up in a in a, you know in an environment where looks and status was very important and making money and so forth and so um, my mother um, had gotten ill and um, I had to take care of her and he's saying that um, because I had to watch over her and take care of her she infected me with uh, TB. Okay. So she passed over, he says, when I was 15 from it. Um, my, she also passed it on to my stepbrother who, pa who passed over because of TB. And so um, without me knowing that I was carrying this disease inside of me, he says, you know, I went to dentist school. I wanted to be a dentist. Um, my father was a pharmacist. And so I decided dentistry. That seemed like something fun. Um, so you know, I did. Uh, I did become a doctor in that. Um, you know, I, I I was a good student. I always did what was right. You know, that's how I was taught. You know, I was brought up. You need to do the right thing. You need to do your. You need to work hard, and you need to show people what you can do. And you need to. You know, um, you need to keep your status high uh, so you can have influential people around you. That's how I was brought up. So for me, that was normal. That was a normal way of thinking. And so um, a little bit before I was um, 21, I started coughing. I started getting all kinds of kind of colds in a way. And so um, when I went to the doctor, they said it was the same thing that my mama had. Um, and so they gave me only a few more months to live. So what happened then? I was 21 years old. So I was just like, okay, so now what? Everything that I had been taught, you know, about doing the right thing and, and keeping up status. And even if you don't like it, you need to do it anyway, because, because, because all these rules and regulations, it all, you know, once I started being confronted with my mortality, it, none of it seemed relevant anymore. None of it seemed to matter anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like a waste of time to still follow the rules and do, and do everything to please others. Um, and, you know, I just kind of turned a switch. I turned a switch and I decided to live life for me and to just make, I mean, they told me I had six months to live. So mm -hmm. I was like, screw it. I'm just going to go out and have fun and, you know, sleep with as many women as I can. And that was my plan, you know, live the, my last six months to the fullest. You um, lived another 15 years, though, didn't you? I know. You know, my, he says, you know, the doctor told me, you know, you need to change climates. It's going to be better for you. So I did try to go south. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, along the way, I kind of got in trouble sometimes. And, <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, you know, but he's saying I had my wits. So I was extremely, you know, I was a lot smarter than most people were <laughs> in those bars. And I could sort of scam him out of it. Um, and so, you know, I just went from place to place, bar to bar, gambled, um, tried all the things that I wanted to try. I had, with, you know, a lot of women, went to bed with a lot of women. And, you know, I just tried to make the best out of my last few months. At least right. that's what I thought. You know, only the few months turned out to be a lot longer. Um, and by that time, by the time I realized, oh, wait, I'm still here, <laughs> yeah. I started getting in trouble, you know, I, I had people wanting me and I, so I had to start moving around from place to place to kind of avoid them. Um, but he says, I did meet Wyatt. He says, he, 
Wyatt, um, he used me for my wits, he says. <laughs> He used me for my wits, but we became really close friends, and I would help him out solving cases, and, um, you know, I I would save his life sometimes, and he would save my life sometimes. You know, it was an equal agreement, he says, and we still went our own way, you know. We were completely different. We had completely individual ways of looking at life, but there was a connection, and the connection there was that we were both lost. We both didn't know what to do. We both uh, felt like our lives um, had been taken from us in some way or form, mm -hmm. and we were just trying to survive. Um, and in that, we found a connection. We found a, a friendship that, you know, a lot of people were against it. Even Wyatt's uh, brothers did not like it that I hung out with the, with him. They thought I was a bad influence. Um, they thought that you know that I always got him in trouble. I probably did, he said. But you know, we I was just trying to enjoy life. So nobody really liked our friendship, but we still stuck together. We still, you know, we would come and go, come and go. You know, uh, we didn't live together, but um, we always seemed to meet up somewhere. We always seemed to be pulled towards each other. Um, and so I was, uh, in a way, he says, um, when everything happened in Tombstone, he says, you know, I just wanted to be there for my friend. I knew I hadn't much longer to go. Um, so for me, I mean, if I got shot, then I was finally relieved of my pain. In a way, it's almost like a suicide mission. You know, I wanted it to end. I wanted it, the pain to go away because I was really good at hiding it, but I was in incredible pain, and I just wanted it to be over. Uh, unfortunately, it never happened. <laughs> you know, you had quite a reputation as a badass. He says I did, but a lot of it was over-exaggerated. See, that's kind of what I was going to ask you, if, if that wasn't the case. So how many people did you actually kill? He's given me two. Okay. So not even three. Okay. Mm -mm. He's saying a lot of stories started surrounding me. And some of the stories I actually made up myself. I was going to say, you probably did not discourage that <laughs> because having that kind of a reputation was probably protection of a sort if folks are afraid of you. Exactly. It was to keep up my, my belief that, you know, don't mess with me. Right. You know? In a way, it was self-protection. Um, I would come up with stories, and then other people made the stories even bigger. Yeah. Uh, so I just kind of allowed, you know, <laughs> allowed the other mouths to make it uh, whatever they wanted it to be. Um, but in a way, it kept me safe because people were sure. afraid of me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it gave me a little bit more of freedom to kind of uh, get away with things. And um, But, yeah, it was very much exaggerated. Um, I did get in trouble. I did do a lot of bidding. Um, I did cheat. Um, <laughs> you did, cheated at cards? He says, yes. Um, I was really good at counting cards. Oh, you were wicked smart then. Yeah. He says, um, they didn't get it. <laughs> they knew I was cheating. They just didn't know how. Um, I know you're just... doing something there, fella, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> I can just see these poor <laughs> big dumb cowboys <laughs> losing all their money. <laughs> Aww. He's actually making me feel like he's really proud of that, that he got away with it. Um, wow. So uh, he's saying, what? You know, you got to use your wits to you survive. Do. You, you have what to use your wits. Well, he says there's nothing to be embarrassed about that. Whatever other people wanted to think about me, that was fine. If they wanted to make me greater than I really was, then that was okay with me. Um, but, you know, it was my way of surviving. And he said, you know, um, I never got that family I wanted. I never got, you know, I did have women in my life. Um, yeah. And he's saying, you know, but I never got um, the whole family thing, which is something that I did want. Yeah. Um, but it just, the moment they told me I was going to die, that just faded away. That was it. Um so he's saying, you know, in in retrospect, if, you know, if I look at my life now, although um, I had a short life, um, it was a kind of an interesting one for me. Um, I don't, I didn't experience it, it as tragic as Wyatt did his. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was more about survival. It was more about um, 
just going with the flow. It was more about releasing all rules and regulations and just doing what I felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, I found freedom. In that, I found um, a liberation. Um, and I found who I really was. And I have to say, I don't believe that I was a bad person. Yeah. Um, in my heart, I had a good heart. And I did care about people. Um, not a lot. I was very picky. But um, I did care about people. And um, in that, I see my life as successful. Um, I became the uh, free, um, liberated uh, person, he says, liberated from all the rules and regulations of law. Um, and I just did what I wanted to do. You were just said, a sovereign hey, being. Good for hey, you. Hey, hey, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so are you two fellas around now? Are you here on this timeline, either one of you? He says, why it is. I'm not. I'm still having fun. <laughs> Good for you. So so what is, uh, does Wyatt want to give us any information about what he's up to now on this timeline? Well, he's saying I'm actually leading a very normal down-to-earth life. Nice. Um, I'm a man. Again, I have two beautiful children and a gorgeous Aww. wife who I adore. Uh, and I'm actually um, at this moment experiencing a very balanced, happy life. So um, it's not exciting. Um, sometimes we kind of need to spice things up. But, um, you know, it's 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 a life of, of um, family. It's That's a life lovely. of family. You know, belonging somewhere. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm 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 having some good experiences in, in this current life. Where really are happy. you? Are you? Can you want to tell us what country you're in? Maybe about how old you are. He says right now, um, 45. Mm -hmm. He's saying I am in Amsterdam at this moment. Ah, lovely. So are you still in the brothel business? <laughs> He's like, no, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> and I have a very yeah. successful... <laughs> he's going, okay, no, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. But he's saying, actually, I have a very successful business. So um, we're doing really good financially, and we're... Um, but it's not that important to me right. at this life. Nice. It's just cost stability for us. Um, what's more important for me is that I spend time with my children, that we make the best of it, and that... I give them um, I give them a more spiritual approach to life is what I'm giving them. That's nice. I'm, I'm supporting them to to follow their own, to really follow what they want to do, uh, and to really follow their heart. Uh, I'm not I'm not giving them any suggestions, and I'm not pushing them in any direction. I am completely relying on them to make their own decisions. And I'm just going to be there to love them and support them. And that's that's my belief system at this moment. That's that's just lovely. What a wonderful father and husband you must be now. And I hope that that helps to heal some of that, the void that Wyatt left with. He says it does. You know, it gives me a different perspective of what things could have been. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you need to see it in both angles, don't you? So um, now I'm getting the other angle, what I always wanted. So um, I'm really happy with this life. And some people might say, okay, well, nothing special there. But you know what? Being not special is actually really peaceful. Pretty special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Doc is still just enjoying being a sovereign being. He's saying, I'm just enjoying everything. And I'm not only enjoying, you know, my current, my lives that are all over um, the timeline and all over the different planets. Um, but, you know, I, I'm also enjoying what, uh, you know, my, what Wyatt is doing. I'm, I'm merging with him and I'm watching over him and yeah. I'm guiding other people to stay true to themselves and to really make their own opinions. And I think that's what we really wanted to um, bring forth in, in our stories is, you know, don't believe the stories. Don't just believe anything blindly. Mm -hmm. um, look into it. Um, make your own opinion about things. What, what feels right to you? Um, and go 
with that because that's where the truth will lie. Um, don't just, you know, it's about taking everything with a grain of salt and first look into it, find your own answers, and that's what the truth will be, he says. That feels true to me. Yeah, I think for everybody, we need to, you know, a lot of things get um, manipulated to mm -hmm. make us feel a certain way, to make us um, go a certain direction, or to even justify certain actions that thing about things that are going on in the world, you know, oh, well, he did that, so that means we can bomb them. Yeah. What about the innocent people? What about the people who are innocent there in those locations? Because mm -hmm. one ruler or a certain amount of people are doing something cruel. Um, there are a lot of innocent bystanders, a lot of innocent children, you know. Um, so we need to really, and this is Adam talking, he's saying we need to really look at ourselves and think about the actions that we are thinking about doing. Are we doing it out of ego? Mm -hmm. Are we doing it out of pride? Are we doing it for the benefit of others? Or, you know, what's the reason behind it? Will it really solve anything? That's what, those are the questions we need to ask ourselves about anything in life. We can't just allow other people to make decisions for us. Mm -hmm. Make your own decisions and stand by them and find that strength within yourself to defend what you believe in. Uh, if you do that, it's the only way that you know we can turn things around. It's, it's the only way that we can turn it into a direction of love instead of into a direction of hate and violence. I love that. I love how you brought these two cowboys forward who have reputations for having been violent, and you have one who, you know, is still, you know, in grief over the actions that his egotistical behavior caused. Um, and you basically have these two people with reputations being badass, violent cowboys who are saying, love yourselves, love people, don't hurt anybody. Yeah. Um, and he said, you know, Mom, I think the most important thing is these people did, you know, they did do things that hurt themselves. You know, they didn't yeah. just hurt others. They, yeah. they damage themselves in the same at the same time, yeah. and they're not proud of them. And you know, we make movies and books, and I don't know what to say. Oh my God, look at these incredible heroes who killed so many people. Um, you know, they took people's lives without any chance of justice, without any chance of being heard. Um, but we think they were the greatest people ever. So there's something wrong in that picture. He says. He says, I'm not here to judge anyone, but think. Right, right. We should reassess what we value. And I love the fact that these two came forward and said, you know, we're not really comfortable being remembered that way because that isn't how it was. Yeah. And I think it's brave of them, you know. That I think it's incredibly that. brave. I mean, incredibly yeah. brave. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm, forward. I'm so glad that they came because um, they seemed very nervous at first, but I think it, it's it's all lightened up. They're like, they're just happy they got yeah, to say yeah. it. How are you they feeling now, it. guys? How are you feeling now? They're saying relieved. Relieved that we we got a chance to, you know, to say the truth. Relieved that we got a chance to show people that we were just human. And um, we had our flaws. And, you know, a lot of it destroyed ourselves. We made our own life sometimes miserable. And, you know, the only one we can blame for that is us. That's the only person we can blame for. Uh, and we take full responsibility for it. So that's take responsibility a, in your life. That's the bravest yeah. thing I think you can do, is really take full responsibility for your own actions. And I think you're very courageous. You were very brave. And I appreciate very much that you came forward and told this story because the time is now for these kinds of stories, you know, to not glorify um, taking other people's lives or not glorify having a reputation uh, of being feared. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we want to bring forth. So they're saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Emma. You're welcome. <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me how you can just bring these guys through and let uh, let them share their stories. It's such a beautiful thing. 
I just, you know, I just like, uh, I don't know. I, I like to give everybody a chance to say what they think yeah. and what they feel. And, and I think it's just interesting, you know, because we get sometimes the wrong image, you know, as history moves on, you know, we kind of forget on what it really was like. We do. Yeah. We do. And without people like you, though, how would they even tell their story? How would this even be possible? I just think it's incredible. It's incredible on so many levels. And the fact that we can do this, that people, individuals can have their own channels and share information with the whole world. And at this point, I want to thank our subscribers and our viewers. And, you know, I just think it's such a wonderful thing that you folks are enjoying this information and that you're benefiting from it. Thank you so very much for watching. Um, if you would like to check out Emma's website, it's www.emmanuelmacintosh.com. Yay! Hooray! Adam is going, I love you all very much. And um, I can't wait to see what John Wayne has to say. He says, I'm so excited. <laughs> so am I. It's going to be wonderful. Okay, folks. So everybody have a good summer. Stay cool. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with John Wayne. All right. Emma, again, Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Love you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.